a quick introduction, I'm very pleased to introduce Rohit, who is better known as Leo by his handle. He's a cybersecurity professional consultant and the founder of the PC Security Channel, which is a, a very popular channel on YouTube that I've, I have been known to occasionally watch, actually, and a trusted source for antivirus tests and product reviews with millions of views. Rohit helps small and large enterprises make informed decisions about cybersecurity and consults with technology vendors to help improve their products. In his free time, he enjoys engaging with his community on Discord, playing games, and gliding at nearby airfields. It's like, check out the side channel, it's cool. Uh, he has a specific interest in cybersecurity research, obviously, artificial intelligence, threat analysis, and testing frameworks. And we're really pleased to have him talk about how important it is to think about context in cybersecurity so you're not drowning in pointless alerts or missing important signals. And take it away, Rohit, thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much for that introduction. We're going to cover a lot of different topics. Hopefully we'll discuss some research topics that'll be of interest to people over here. So let's get started. I like to start things off with a quote. This is one from Michael Crichton. In the information society, nobody thinks. We expect it to banish paper, but we actually banish thought. Now, what does this mean? We've actually outsourced a lot of our thinking to other things, if you haven't realized in the last few years. We rely on our smartphones for everything. We rely on the other people, the internet. And that means that we can be hyper specialists. We can specialize on very few things, not worry about the broader picture. But sometimes when the broader picture breaks in, it can cost us. In cybersecurity, that happens quite literally in dollars and pounds. So we'll talk about that with specific incidents, but there's also a joke so a scientist says, my findings are pointless when taken out of context. And then the correction that's published is scientist claims, findings are pointless. And this is the exact, you know, kind of problems you can run into when you're focused on one thing. This is something that's been discussed in philosophy as well. So it's not really a new concept. Nietzsche and uh, thus spake Zarathustra mentions a midget with a giant ear as a warning against hyper-specialization. Now, if I'm doing a talk about context in cybersecurity and I don't give you context, well, that would be hypocritical. So we'll start off with some context about how we got here and how that has brought me to this talk. As mentioned, I run the PC Security Channel. It's one of the most popular cybersecurity channels on YouTube. And one of the things that has fascinated me about this is the audience. We have people all the way from kids who have spent more days in Minecraft than they have on planet Earth, all the way to CISOs, Fortune 500 companies. It really makes me wonder, why would all sorts of people watch these videos? I mean, some of them are quite technical. When we started, like one of the main areas of focus was testing security products. Why would a kid watch that? But then again, why would a kid remember the names of dinosaurs. I have kids on Discord who come up and tell me, uh, hey, I got this Trojan agent Win32 VB this. And it always you know, makes me wonder, like what gets uh, a kid's attention in this? And I think it has something to do with unpredictability and complex systems and a much broader message than some technical niche of cybersecurity. We'll get to that by going through the journey that brought me here. So. I was a typical high school kid, loved playing games. This is Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2. It's a bit dated today, but uh, it was one of the top of the line games at the time. And while I was enjoying this one day, I got interrupted by this. Yeah, nobody likes that. <laughs> well, these days people do because it's nostalgic and the Windows XP sounds were great. But my reaction was, I hate this hacker crap. Thus began my journey through cybersecurity, trying to understand the systems that brought me the games, that brought me all of this power through technology and the intricacies that could go wrong in that. Now, there are a couple of other things that drew me to this field, and I'll mention a couple of them here. So here are some classic examples of viruses from movies. On the left, we have whiterabbit.obj, which was the virus used in Jurassic Park by Dennis Nedry to disrupt the computer systems so that he could steal the embryos. Obviously that had more consequences than just him being able to steal embryos. On the right, we have the exact opposite scenario where the virus is the force for the good. It's used by Jeff Goldblum and Will Smith over there 
to essentially disable the defenses of an alien civilization so we could defeat them in air combat. Both of these cases actually represent real world problems that we face today. And another important thing about both of these cases is they connect cybersecurity to the real world and show you how important these things can be. In both of these movies, cybersecurity had very real consequences. On the left, it basically led to the dissolution of Jurassic Park. The dinosaurs got out, could have led to an extinction event. On the right, it allowed us to defeat a much more sophisticated civilization. So cybersecurity has real world consequences and we can see this quite clearly. We see this all the time, like the case on the left when a company gets hit by ransomware. We also see the opposite when we use the offensive security capabilities that we have to take down terrorist bases or to defend ourselves by doing hacking or offensive security research. So both of these are quite real world cases. Now I'm going to go into the specifics of how I got here. I started off doing YouTube, funnily enough, that's the first thing I got into at the same time. And again, like this is a linear chart. Obviously it's not always a straight line. Many of these things happen in parallel, but for the sake of simplicity, I started off doing YouTube uh, around the time when I was just getting out of high school. That's when I started doing a bachelor's in computer science. And at the same time, I got hired as a malware analyst for a company called MCSoft. So that is where my interest of, um, you know, just looking at things purely from a hobbyist perspective turned into, okay, now I'm looking at malware writing signatures, helping detect threats. It got me into the industry. And at the same time, I was doing my education and I transitioned into an MSc at the University of Nottingham. And I also transitioned some time in between into a project manager role. Since then, I've had uh, multiple roles as project manager. And finally, I decided to start my own business. So now let's get to the meat of the talk. So let's talk about modern cyber threats. What forms do they take? We see things like fallless malware, registry key entries, um, machines that are hacked without any you know, direct evidence of malware executing. We've got zero day attacks, happens all the time, hacked systems, data breaches, stolen credentials, employees giving out their passwords unwittingly, APTs, nation state actors getting involved. In most of these cases, what we find is detection technology isn't necessarily good enough to stop these threats. But at the same time, we have another problem, which is just as serious, that a simple script uh, for a pop-up that says, happy birthday, dad, probably written by some kid, is detected by 25 engines on virus total. So how did we get here? We are detecting <laughs> literally code that says happy birthday dad as malware, but we're not able to stop sophisticated attacks that this technology was built to do. So let's take a look at some modern detection parameters. Some common ones, digital signatures, import DLLs and functions, import hashes, packing techniques. Some scanners will detect files that are packed a certain way strings related to the use of certain calls, file entropy, how condensed a, a file is, section ranges. And the question is, why do any of these indicate whether or not a file is malicious? And usually nobody has an answer, they just do. And the reason is that's what we see in the malware. And that brings us to the question of whether or not our defenses are proactive or reactive. Because a lot of the time you will hear the word proactive protection when you're looking at security products, when you're in cybersecurity, it's a very common word in the industry. Everybody says that they are proactive, but are they really? Because this is what happens. Malware performs a certain behavior. Analysts, like I used to be, research that malware. And we come up with a detection strategy. And detection strategies can take various forms. They can just be signatures. They can just be blacklists. But that's rarely the case. I mean, people think that the real issue is we're using signatures when in reality signatures can be quite sophisticated. And at the end of the day, like a behavioral blocking rule is also a signature. HIPS uh, is also just a, a set of rules that we then use to uh, detect certain class of programs. So all of these are examples of detection strategies. And if anything flags in our detection strategy, we detect it as uh, malicious behavior, basically. 
Now, the problem with this approach is that eventually the list of malicious behaviors expands to include almost everything, and that produces false positives. And as a scientist, a false positive is actually worse than a false negative because you are blocking an application that was fine. That would be the equivalent of throwing innocent people in jail because you think they did something they didn't. So what do we do now? And uh, some companies come up with a solution, whitelist all the safe files. So we've moved from blacklist to a whitelist and that's just as terrible. So we started off about 10, 15 years ago with the first serious AV programs that were having all sorts of capabilities. We automated the entire process of dealing with malware and uh, 10, 15 years later, we are back with the same problem. Now we just have a whitelist instead of a blacklist. And if you don't believe me, look at some of the next gen security programs. They rely on a whitelist to let say false through, and then they have sophisticated rules that will report to a SOC or basically a team of people, all the behavior that the system is performing. So either they're going to be swarmed by false positives because nobody can possibly look at that behavior. We need automation at that scale, or you're going to end up executing malware. So we haven't really solved the detection problem. We're back at square one. So how do we solve this problem? And hopefully this is going to bring some interest in this field and maybe you know some of you can do research projects in this area because it is quite interesting. So I like to use this quote from Elon Musk, approaching things from a physics framework because that teaches you to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. And this is really how scientists think. Most people don't think like this. Most people reason by analogy. They think of something and they think, oh, you know, what else do I know that's similar? But if we go back to the first principles, what is malware really? It's uh, malicious software. And malicious is characterized by malice, intending to do harm. So the key word here is intent. What does that mean really? So let's talk about malicious behavior. Transferring data to a server isn't malicious. What makes it malicious is info stealers. Crypto mining isn't malicious either. It's perfectly fine. But if you do it silently, now it's an example of malware. File encryption isn't malicious. In fact, it's a security mechanism. But ransomware is certainly malicious. In each case, the behavior is entirely determined by context. Without context, there is no way to decide whether any of these behaviors are to be considered malicious. And that is the problem that is faced by security programs because computers don't understand malice. They don't understand intent. They understand behavior. So if a system notices encryption and you set a rule that says encryption is a malicious behavior because ransomware does it, now it's just going to detect encryption. It's not detecting ransomware. So again, going back to the question, what makes a file malware? These are the kind of answers that you would come up with if you thought about it. Does it perform actions that result in a detrimental outcome for the user instead of benefiting the user? Does it perform these actions without the user's consent? Because you can obviously perform actions yourself that are detrimental. In that case, should that be blocked too? Does it hide itself partly or completely from the user? That's the whole concept of the Trojan horse. And so ultimately, it's the interaction between the user and the program that determines whether or not something is malicious, not the program itself. And this is why there are a lot of parameters that I believe are undervalued in the cybersecurity space. And not a lot of research is done into this. So. I'd like to bring them up. First thing, screenshots. What's happening on screen? Quite trivial to get a screenshot of the system. It's not computationally very expensive. Usually assume that there's nothing, it has nothing to do with malware, but why not? Because if the user is not presented with information and something is happening behind the scenes that shouldn't happen, maybe that's a good indicator. Windows open. What kind of windows is the application presenting to the user? Are they relevant to the operations that it's performing behind the scenes? Window titles. What does the application say that is being presented to the user? User input. 
does the user interact and tell the application to do what it's doing, or did it decide to do it by itself? File handles, what files are being accessed or written to? What level of involvement does the user have in making those decisions? And that brings us to the detection problem. So this is a pretty interesting problem for many different aspects because we're constantly trying to model behavior and come up with a solution to something that's not necessarily what we think it is. So for example, as I stated in the previous slide, we don't really think about these parameters when we're writing detection rules. Usually we're looking at PE file data, what kind of strings it has. We're looking at the properties of the code itself to decide whether or not it's malicious before it's executed. And so basically we're taking a multi-dimensional entity and we're mapping it into one or two dimensions and we're making our decisions based on those dimensions. And that is tricky because we're missing out on a lot of context and a lot of information. So the conclusions that we draw from the shape in the background, as you can see, the 2D shape may not necessarily represent what we're actually seeing. And so this was uh, partly my master's thesis building a detection engine. So I decided to take on the problem of ransomware detection because it's particularly problematic. Ransomware costs industry a ton of money. I think a billion dollars is paid in ransom every year. That's ridiculous. We literally pay that much money to cyber criminals so that we can get our data back because we can't do anything about it. This is a brief overview of the system that I built. Now, this was based on information retrieval techniques. So what I did is I took a bunch of PE files, that's portable executable, and using dynamic analysis, I filtered them manually into a set of ransomware, set of clean files, put it through a feature extraction engine. I put the ransomware and the clean files through a TF-IDF engine. This is an information retrieval technique and the thing that made this approach different from what all of the other solutions were doing, because a lot of solutions would just do this kind of analysis, they would use an AI training algorithm. So what we did here was we did a direct comparison for every ransomware against about 40 or 50 files to figure out, is there enough context for us to make the determination that this should be ransomware? And we'll take a look at the results as to how that turned out. So on the right, you have string-based scoring systems where we you know, essentially use strings within the application, the code itself, to determine whether something's ransomware or not. So the Xs represent the ransomware. These circles represent the safe files. And as you can see, I mean, string-based scoring works. Most of the Xs are towards the top. There's only one circle towards the top, but there's a lot of muddy water if you go towards the bottom of the chart. There's a lot of cases where we just can't make a good enough distinction. Now, if we take a look on the left, it's a very different story. We kind of have a, a similar pattern of variability when it comes to the axis, but I mean, there's a very clear difference between even the lowest X and the you know highest circle. We were able to reach this kind of uh, a result by using more of a context, even in static analysis, even without looking at application behavior. So now let's get to testing because the PC security channel is all about testing. That is really what I do. The detection engine uh, problem was just an experiment. And this is what we're encountered with when you try to get into testing. <laughs> so that this is the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which is the industry standard for understanding the different types of offensive security testing, initial access, execution, persistence, privilege escalation, defense evasion. These are essentially techniques that attackers use to bypass systems. And then each of these obviously has its uh, minutia. This is again, not helpful in telling me whether or not the latest ransomware is going to be able to infiltrate my system. How do I design a test to do that? And that brings us to Malex, which is our main technical project. What I decided to do when I encountered the MITRE ATT&CK framework and the issues that it poses was to create an endpoint security testing framework that helps a real world user understand what exactly their level of preparedness is or how well protected they would be in case of an actual attack. And again, I'll walk you through some of the technicalities of the system. So this is the full technology stack. 
essentially we have a feed. The left hand side is your typical threat intelligence processing system. So we've got all sorts of different sources coming in, static analysis, kind of the stuff that we talked about earlier with the detection engine and then extracting threat intelligence out of them. And then we have a dynamic analysis and testing system that allows us to model the behavior of actual threats that we get from our threat intelligence system. And then we use that behavioral analysis to then model the most interesting kinds of behaviors in relevant threats. So for example, we would try to model typical backdoor behavior based on recent backdoor malware samples and how they behave in a virtual environment. We would study that and then we would model that to create a test that would still refer to the MITRE framework, but it would be a test of an entire backdoor behavior. And I'll tell you why this is important as well. Before that, just uh, some more technical details since you guys might be interested. The threat data processing, we set up a Redis server to do this. We use the PE file Python library. So if you may be familiar with that, it allows you to extract a lot of you know useful information from uh, portable executable files. This is again commonly used by most anti-malware systems. And we then filtered it for age and relevance. So we got rid of the garbage samples and we found the most interesting and important and enriched samples to test with. And then we have our dynamic analysis system. This is where we discovered some of the parameters that I mentioned earlier in terms of screenshots, windows, and why they were useful. So part of the reason that that's uh, mentioned is because when we did our initial testing with Malix, we found these to be quite useful when classifying samples. And then we formatted all of this data, which was in JSON for user classification. So we could do things like supervised learning, and then we get to the offensive testing part. So this is where we decided since MITRE is already a well-recognized framework, instead of going cross purposes to it, we decided to use that in combination with atomic tests, which are essentially tests for each of the one, you know, many techniques that are outlined in MITRE that I showed you in the annoying chart earlier. And we combined that with our research and testing to come up with a test that would not only focus on specific atomic tests within MITRE, but come up with a holistic test that would look at many different aspects and give you the kind of answers that we get asked from our clients, which is like, am I susceptible to the next wasted locker attack? I heard Garmin got hit and looking real bad for them. So would that be possible in our environment? We have a little bit of a demo here. We'll fast forward through this a little bit because uh, we don't have to go through all the little details, but essentially we are running multiple tests on this VM and we've got Komodo's HIPS module just to show us what's happening. And we're going to allow each of these behaviors to look at how our test script works. And over here, we're using a very common technique, which is modification of shadow copies, privilege escalation. Then we're using Red Server 32 exploitation. That's going to allow us to install a root certificate um, and basically load DLLs that are malicious. We won't load malicious DLLs here, but it's just an example of the technique. Because Windows uses dynamic loading of DLLs, it means you can essentially install a DLL and then run it as an application without the system knowing. So you would never know that you were executing an application. So we're going to allow everything in this video. And I think the only thing we block is um, the persistence behavior. So we don't allow it to create a startup item. And then finally, when it's over, we get our results. And the results show us that certain behavior was blocked, certain behavior was allowed, but more importantly, it shows us at what stage the behavior was blocked. And this is important because MITRE does not really give you that information. MITRE just tells you whether or not something blocks a specific action. But realistically, it's not any one of those actions that cause us a compromise. It's a, it's a series or a pattern because again, there are legitimate programs that will perform those types of actions. So what we found is useful is combining a series of such actions in a realistic pattern and then designing an offensive test that takes that into account. We've had some success with this. A lot of major clients loved it. Now we'll go back to the theme of our talk, which is the importance of context. I've got some art and some lines by Wordsworth here. There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common site to me did seem appareled in celestial light. 
the glory and the freshness of a dream. What does this really mean? I mean, Wordsworth is really alluding to the fact that when we're children, we see everything, the forest for the trees. We see the world as it is, as untrammeled reality. And as we grow up, we learn to focus. We learn to focus on very narrow things. We ignore most of the world in the pursuit of something that's very specific. And that's fine, that gives us a lot of power. But at the same time, it robs us of a lot of things as well. When you're too blinded by, and this is applicable for an individual as it is for an industry, when you're too focused on a problem, you often ignore most of the problem, which is outside your field of perception. In games, this is like the aspect ratio problem. So you could easily have things outside your field of view that are affecting what's in your field of view that you are unaware of. So it's very important to take a step back sometimes and approach problems from their fundamental reality. Like what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And this is something that's very much lacking in cybersecurity at the moment. We've got a lot of effort being put into certain areas. They're not necessarily the best or smartest solutions to the fundamental problems that are being faced in terms of determining malicious behavior. I would love to see more academic research in this area, and I do think that that is a bit dated. My master's thesis, I looked at like 30 or 50 papers on this topic, and the industry is really we're in sync with what is being tried by academics. I mean, people have tried to look at CPU cycles to predict ransomware behavior, for example. There's all sorts of interesting aspects to look at in terms of this problem. And I feel like the industry just keeps going round and round in circles. So there's definitely a lot of potential for any who want to explore. But equally, I want to bring us back to the reason. Why do we do this? Why are people interested in cybersecurity? And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that cybersecurity represents the complexity and the unpredictable nature of reality in many ways. And that is probably why people watch the tests that we do. And I've seen this comment many times. People say, well, I'm a Linux user. I have nothing to do with Windows systems and their cybersecurity, but here I am watching this test video. I mean, why do they do that? Why do they find it entertaining? And so I want to end off with a really fun video. And that was not intentional. Uh-oh, we have cascading I.O. errors. This reminds me of Windows XP again. So NordVPN is hacked. Security noobs, oh my god, uninstall. Seems anything with the keyword Fortnite is going to make news these days. As always, I have some great news for you here at the PC Security Channel. Oh, crap. Your personal files are being encrypted. Stop the ransomware from causing further damage while you're watching this video. That's the intro, brought to you by Counter-Strike Global Offensive, the most offensive thing in the world, other than maybe US politics. You've been watching the PC security channel. As with all such stories, this one begins a long, long time ago. Long before the age of next-gen AVs, Windows Defenders, and GDPR policies. And got picked up by CNN, which was initially spotted by... Someone called... Leo. Huh. And I think we've got the culprit for the internet issue. Trojan DNS changer. Boom. Service host. Ooh, system 32. This is nasty. Ouch. But as long as it's going, I'm good with it. It's not like I'm getting tortured, it's just my poor VM. <laughs> One of my projects during the time was researching malware classification engines and in specific building a ransomware detection system. And today I'll get to show you guys a brief demo of it. But look at these analytics, people don't want to see that. What people want to see is troll ransomware videos. So we have to give them that, right? Of course. But here's the catch, if T-Series beats PewDiePie, the private key will be deleted and your file's gone forever. Then we'll do the second opinion scans. Oh no, I have to update again. I don't think we even need to wait for the scan to finish here. We've got a ton of active stuff. There's a ransomware here. It seems the application is particularly unrelenting. It doesn't seem to even let me open File Explorer at the moment, just hogging out the CPU. I, the reason it's spelled differently is not because the ransomware author doesn't know how to type. It's just because it's in German. Surprising one that, isn't it?
Are you waiting for me to do the intro? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, it is your video, so. Hello, and welcome to the PC Security Channel. Odd setting for a video. Unusual setting for a TPSC video. Yeah, I do. Most of it looks like gibberish, which is perfectly normal. By the way, I won a cool book. I actually got this book for asking the best question at one of the talks. It's signed as well. Somebody tell these people, I'm moving, I don't have space to carry stuff out. I figure out the features, let's say, that we're using to train our AI or something like that. They can easily exploit that to create malware that's always going to be undetectable. And, and this is really the problem. Chocolates. Chocolatey treats. I've got some Kit Kats. I think Bribing I've people. I've got normal, normal Kit Kats, dark Kit Kats, dark caramel. That's a good choice, sir. This time, it's PewDiePie that's to blame. Or T-Series. I think it's T-Series to blame because they're the ones catching up in terms of sub count. Panda. What an innocuous name, right? Panda831. A panda wouldn't do anything bad to me. So we've still got Luke Fallwalker. The legend. But today we'll be taking a look at the legendary, one and only, McAfee Total Protection. Most of it looks like gibberish, which is perfectly normal. And let's see what the solution is. It doesn't even give you an option. There's no option to go back. Here's a picture of the encrypted files. What can I do about it? So this video is going to be a full guide of dealing with ransomware. So I think the password is... password. Luck runs out. If McAfee blocks it, it's good. If it doesn't, well, as they say in the movies, God help us. This is a brand new install of Windows, so this is a perfectly safe system to use. But we have three advanced issues. Turns out we've just encountered the largest data breach in history. I think the biggest problem was letting this Trojan run wild. This is still active, and I think it's still creating more samples, downloading more malware, while well, doing what malware does. You've been watching the PC Security Channel. Lots of goodies for you this December. I hope you enjoyed it. This is Leo, and as always, stay informed, stay secure. So I think it's only fitting that we end talk about context and cybersecurity with a series of jokes made by out of context videos being put together. So I hope you enjoyed that. And now we'll open up to questions. Thank you so much.